morning, good morning, good morning. A grand rainy day. The uh, 16th of October 2020. And uh, I'm late again. Well, I'm not that late. Yeah, I am late. <laughs> I've, my clock on my car is slightly different from my watch. My watch got to recommend this watch. I can just remember what it is. It's a Casio Wave Scepter. And it's a... Uh, oh, I'll show it to you there. No, no, no. And it's nice. It's good looking. But I've tried every different type of watch. <clears throat> I've tried watches that uh, have got batteries in them. Which were, when I was a boy, there were only wind-up watches. And then along came these, you know, Swiss sort of uh, Swiss movements, etc. And then Long comes uh, quartz watches, which were depended on the vibration of a quartz crystal and were relatively extremely accurate. I mean, I mean extremely accurate. I mean more more accurate than quartz watches are now. Quartz watches now, what they've found is that if your quartz watches isn't accurate to a few seconds a day, nobody cares. But in the early days of quartz watches. You wanted a scientific instrument that was like accurate to one second every every millennium so they uh, used high quality quartz crystals and timed them extremely accurately I would imagine every single watch was uh, calibrated to the vibration of the quartz crystal in it but not now so but this is a quartz this is a quartz watch because I don't so what they've done is they've got round it by resetting the uh, time every day to a signal which used to come from rugby but I don't think it does anymore I think it comes from Europe anyway the point is it uh, sort of calibrates itself so it's always accurate to the second which is very useful because although we always used to run to time we now have to run we have to run to the second we have to run to the second because we meet people we, we don't have a common waiting area anymore and people come in the back door and so uh, what we, we do is they drive there and then they ring us and say they've arrived and we say we'll wait in your car and then we'll meet you at the back door at like 10 o'clock and by 10 o'clock I mean not not five seconds to 10 and certainly not five seconds past 10 because they're already really pissed off by Five seconds past ten, they're already really pissed off. So, you know, it's like ten o'clock or a minute to ten or something. Well, a minute to ten is too early because they haven't got out of their car by then. So, uh, you know, so it's taken timekeeping to a new high. So, we've got a wall clock that has got this atomic signal, and uh, and I have now got a wristwatch that's on an atomic signal. Although I suppose you could use your mobile phone if you. You know, the old great aficionado of clocks and watches. But um, anyway, it's uh, unfortunate because uh, if people come by bus, uh, or more particularly by taxi, it's a problem because the taxi will come like 20 minutes early. And then it'll drop them off 15 minutes or 10 minutes early and during the summer that's been okay and occasionally we've had a put a chair outside and they can wait you know but they can't come in because quite likely we've got other patients inside and you can't you know we just don't have to we can't we can't do this ridiculous sliding block puzzle arrangement whereby we get they have a shared space in the surgery so basically they have to stay outside in the public space not not the common space in the building that's now off bounds but outside in the car park in the public space so <clears throat> Lou my nurse used to uh, she left the chair outside and I brought the chair in and, and she said well why have you brought the chair in you know because that's there for the patients to sit if they're waiting to come in and they didn't come by car and I said I don't want 
the chair to be there because what will happen is they'll get used to arriving early and sitting on the chair. And I don't want it to be a thing. I want it to be a thing of last resort. It was like, oh dear, what a shame. You're 20 minutes early. I don't know what you're going to do. Go down, go down the shops and mooch around the shops or something, you know. I'm trying to get these patients to arrive on time, which is... Uh, it's difficult and will take about two years because that's what I've worked out is approximately the, the amount of time that's necessary to get to train patients to do anything is about two years and that's mainly because only after about two years do you stop getting patients in who um, who haven't been you know since the rules were changed and so uh, I mean, and I've owned a, hang on, I've got to put my wing mirror out. I've got an automatic wing mirror. There it goes. I've, um, yeah, so uh, I've owned the surgery for five years now. And, uh, was, you know, I've, I've very, very occasionally get a patient in who's not been in since before I, I bought it. And I had one about a month ago quite unusual now but there's like a fat what they call a fat tail you know you have a, a tail of patients who drift in some some have been in recently and know what's what and others haven't and then some just don't read the letter you send them about the, the, the changes and, and come in the wrong way and then there's other um, builders who come in who come in and they're working on a job and they just want to use your toilet so even though we've told them that they're not really supposed to use the toilet because we have to give them a mask and we have to give them a, a wipe and everything for the door handles and everything. So anyway, I've got a, I had two patients booked in yesterday, nine o'clock, and uh, at nine o'clock they rang up and said, "Look, uh, you know, can we reschedule because?" We rescheduled from last week. Last week we were in at 11 o'clock and you put us back like a week or I don't know whether we put them back or they put themselves back a week or something. And But instead of being put in at 11 o'clock, which is the, which is what stupid people tend to assume, like if you're going to put them back a week, that you put them back a week to the same time. And if other pe people assume that you've got far more uh, availability in terms of slots than you actually have you know do you know do you know get do you get people who ring you up and say um, you know I uh, I need a filling or something I wonder what what you've got next Wednesday and the answer is next Wednesday I've got a day full of patients what have you got you know so you have to sometimes you have to sort of let people down a bit I must admit it has changed slightly because of the COVID uh, rush of work with you know because we've got the ffp2 and three masks and all the all the ppe and everything so we can more or less carry out whatever we like so we can do implants and bridges and uh, surgical extractions and you name it um but um anyway it was it was just weird that they rung at night and then i said well that's all right come in at half past 10 i've got a slot at half past 10 oh no can we rebook oh no can we rebook and then when I looked at the notes of the other person, not the girl, the, the bloke, turns out he was a massively nervous patient and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and can only come in if she can come in with him sort of thing. And so, I mean, it's far more obvious that what's happened is that uh, uh, they've sort of, she spent until nine o'clock trying to coax and cajole him to come in. And he's just sat there with his thumb in his mouth saying, no, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. And so she's finally had to ring up and say, look, I can't, I can't tell you when, but I'm just going to have to ring you back. You know, is that okay? Which is not okay, because the nurse and I had to stand around looking at each other for about an hour. Although we do always manage to do some admin or something. Um, but I mean, you know, people are just not honest with you, are they? It's, it's such, dishonesty is literally is the default position for most people. Like, uh, she wouldn't say, no, I, I can't get him to come in. If only she'd been honest, 
Now, really, I'm more inclined not to see her in future because they may cancel, you know, and so we're going to have to do something like charge them in advance, and then, uh, you know, the whole thing is just is just gone sour right from the first day. And then I uh, was driving the car along, not this one, Suzuki, and the brakes start grinding. So, and I'm surprised because it's only been in the um, driver service uh, two months ago. Anyway. Uh, I popped it in again and they said oh no you all oh, your brake pads are worn right down to the uh, the discs and they're grinding on the discs and you're gonna have to have new discs 400 quid so I sent them an email and said uh, how is it that these discs were given a green the green light less than three months ago and now you're telling me that they're destroyed metal on metal because you don't mind paying for disc pads, do you? I mean, paying for disc pads is part of driving a car when the disc pads wear out. But for my entire life, I have tried to avoid paying for disc, discs, the actual discs. And you shouldn't have to pay for the discs. The pads wear out, not, and they don't, they're not supposed to wear out so much, so they start grinding away on the discs. She says, oh, your caliper's seized. That's why that's why it's worn the pads out and uh, gone straight through to the discs which you know is total bs it's total bs for a start they they were grinding for three or four weeks before we could get it in for a service secondly what they used to grind when you braked but then as you drove away the grinding stopped right so you could drive along without any grinding it was only after you braked and then after for a few seconds after you braked so i know the caliper wasn't seized you stupid bent. I know the caliper wasn't seized. You lying cow. Because the caliper was, was loosening up as normal. So she's trying to tell me that the day that car came out of the service, God himself, almighty, struck that caliper and seized it up, wore the brake pads out, wore the disc out, and then released the caliper so that it didn't grind while I was driving along. I mean, how on earth do they expect people to swallow this kind of BS? What can you do? It's difficult, isn't it? Because I know I've had patients who, who have, you know, have spoken to me in, in the same sort of way, you know, like I, I had a bloke who um, said his, his filling was sensitive to cold. This is a guy I'd said the, the tooth would probably need a root filling. And he said that after a few weeks, his tooth had got very sensitive and particularly sensitive to cold. I said, yeah, the nerve's dying off. Exactly as I told you it would. He said, it can't be that. He said, it must be, you must have done the filling wrong. He says, you've left a hole in the filling. Uh, the, the, where the cold's getting in through the hole. I mean, what? I said, okay, look. And that's the trouble. As soon as they step over that line. As soon as they say. And sometimes you have to prompt them to say it. Because they won't say it. But I say something like, like are you, are you saying that you think that we didn't do the filling right? And they're like, mm, yeah, I think I am. And you're like, right, okay, fine. I will write to you and send you the address and telephone number of the private patient complaints procedure. While your nerve is dying, you could be ringing them up and showing them my quote, which states quite clearly, and the notes, which state quite clearly that the nerve was going to die and the information leaflet on fillings the state that where the tooth heavily filled 20 to 40 percent of the nerves then go on to die so of course we haven't heard anything from him although we might still but then last night we had quite a nice little case where this little girl i assume she's a little girl but you know probably in her 20s had a lip bar or something some stupid thing through her front lip and one of the dumbbell things was uh, you know these people put their dumb into dumbbell 
and uh, it had been banging away on a lingual propeller between her lower central incisors. And that, in combination with her being a bit of a scale generator and never ever seeing the hygienist, means that she's got this big red old bulbous propeller where she's worried is uh, something terrible going on in her mouth. So I told her, she's taken, fortunately, she's taken the mouth decoration out. Those mouth decorations are never a good thing, are they? They're never a good thing. I've never ever seen one that didn't do some sort of damage, either to the, the gums or the patients coughed and chipped, chipped one of their lower incisors or something. They're just, they're just an accident waiting to happen. Anyway, she's quite sensibly at last taking it out, and um, I told her to. But anyway, she's self-isolating at the moment, so she can't come in for two weeks. But basically, she just wanted reassurance. I've never seen the woman before, and she didn't. Um, she rang me on my way home at five o'clock, and I said, "Send me a picture." So she sent me a picture at seven, and I looked at it about half past eight, and uh, gave her a, a, a reply. You know, half past eight again, entirely free of charge, entirely free of charge. Just happy to be a dentist and to be of service. I think you've got to do that. I think you've got to, you've got to be like that. You've got to be, you've got to walk the walk, haven't you? You've got to, if you're a dentist, you've got to be just committed to the profession, which includes dealing with people out of hours and sacrificing valuable surgery time to patients who are nervous and don't turn up and stuff like that. As long as you're supported by a ton of extremely wealthy patients who make up the difference. Anyway, nice to talk to you. Talk to you soon. Bye.